Welcome to podcast number one from chapter eight, where we're going to cover photosynthesis. Uh, photosynthesis is the process in which a plant uses the energy from light to make its own food in the form of carbohydrates. But the first section we're going to talk about is what is energy? Energy is defined as the ability to do work. And this energy is going to be captured two different ways by living things. The first one is an autotroph. All right. Now let me tell you what these words mean. See this part where it says troph? This word means to eat. And then this part here where it says auto, that essentially means yourself. So as you can see here, an autotroph essentially eats itself because it's made its own food. All right, over here we've got troph, which also means to eat, but we have hetero. And hetero means different. So in this case, you have an organism that will eat something or get its food from something different than itself. So an autotroph gets its food or its energy or its, its materials that are going to be used to make more of itself from itself. And over here, a heterotroph, it's going to get it from a different organism. All right, so as you can see here, autotrophs are going to make their own food. Uh, we know autotrophs better as plants, uh, photosynthetic bacteria. Uh, we're also going to know them as some of the, uh, let's make that B look a little better, uh, some of the protists. Uh, euglena, for example, is a protist that can do um, photosynthesis, uh, your algae. But we also have a different one called a chemosynthetic bacteria. And chemosynthetic organisms, are instead of using light as their major energy source to produce these carbohydrates, they're going to use inorganic chemicals. And we're going to find chemosynthetic bacteria in the hot vents that are down in the bottom of the ocean. Uh, you're going to find them in some hot springs. Very, very inhospitable climates where you're going to find those guys. All right, next up, heterotrophs. Um, these must eat other organisms. So these would be all your animals. So if you're not a plant, uh, you're going to be a heterotroph. All right? So this would include like your decomposers like fungi and lots of your bacteria, uh, all of your animals, of course, uh, most of the protists. Um, those are going to be your heterotrophs. So make sure you know the difference between an autotroph. They cannot make their own food. Hetero I'm sorry, autotrophs can make their own food usually by photosynthesis, but maybe by chemosynthesis. And then we have heterotrophs who must eat different things or other organisms. All right, living things must use chemical energy. All right, I want to highlight this chemical energy part. All right, now chemical energy is going to be found in two places. Number one is going to be electrons. Electrons contain a lot of energy. If you can remember back in chapter two, when we were talking about atomic structure, the electrons were found in an energy level. They're full of tons of energy. All right. Now, changing energy levels is how light is produced. All right. So let's draw a quick little atom here. All right. So this will be the nucleus of the atom. And let's use this yellow here. All right. And this is where there would be some electrons. So we have one energy level. We have two energy levels. All right, so if we've got an electron here, we'll use red for an electron. Let's say that electron jumps up to this level. That electron has now become excited. But that's not very stable. So it's going to hop back down here. Well, when it does that, light shoots out. And so what happens in a light bulb is you have electrons going up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, thousands of times a second. And every time it goes down, light comes out. All right, so energy in these electrons are going to be used for a number of chemical reactions. We're going to see that later in this chapter, too. All right, the second place is going to be in chemical bonds. And if you can remember from chapter two when we talked about endothermic and exothermic, these chemical bonds, when you make them, that stores energy. That would be an anabolic process. It would also be an endergonic process. When you break a bond, you release energy. This would be a catabolic reaction, or this would also be referred to as an exergonic. All right? Let's go ahead and write these off to the side, since you guys may not remember all these. Okay? So when you make a bond, 
that's anabolic. Remember, ana builds. That takes energy. Or it can be endergonic. You're storing energy inside. Gonic refers to energy. Ender means inside. And then, of course, when you break a bond, choose a different color for that stuff. Come back to this green. This would be catabolic. Remember, the cat breaks things. And then you have uh, exergonic. In other words, the energy will exit the molecules. All right. So this should be a little bit of review from Chapter 2. All right, ATP, also known as adenosine triphosphate, ATP for short, is the primary energy molecule that's going to be used by living things. When energy needs to be transferred from one molecule to the next, it is going to be done by ATP. All right. Now, ATP is a special nucleotide. Remember, a nucleotide is the monomer. This is the monomer of a nucleic acid. Let me get that caught up in here. All right. So this would be very similar to what, uh, I think that's misspelled. Uh, this would be very similar to what's in DNA and RNA. So if you remember your three parts of a nucleic acid, you're going to have a five carbon sugar and an ATP, the sugar is ribose. So very similar to an RNA nucleotide. You're also going to have a nitrogenous base, and in this case, it's adenine. That's where the word adenosine comes from, because there's adenine in there. But what makes this one different than any kind of other nucleotide is the fact that it has not one, but it has three phosphates groups. So as you can see here, adenosine triphosphate. Now, it's between these phosphate is where the energy is stored. And you can see that in this picture. All right. Now, in a number of places, these bonds here are referred to as, let me draw another arrow over to this one. These are referred to as high energy phosphate bonds. I'm just going to use a P for phosphate. All right. Now, these bonds do not have the same amount of energy. This one has a higher amount of energy. This one has a medium amount, and this one has very small. Kind of think of like the beds in the in the three bears. This one's a little too hard. This one's a little too soft. That one's just right. And so what will happen is, is that when a cell wants to transfer energy, it'll chop that phosphate off, and energy is released. And if it wants to replace a little bit more, it chops that one off. Right. Simple as that. Now, if it wants to recharge it, it just puts the phosphates back on. All right, so what we have here is the ADP ATP cycle. Now, see this flashing down here? This is a reversible reaction. It's very reversible, all right? And it happens all the time. In fact, you need to survive just a day of doing nothing. You need to have approximately, now we'll say, 95 pounds of ATP just to keep you alive every day at any given time you only have one gram think about this could you carry 95 pounds of ATP there's going to be girls in your classroom that don't even weigh 95 pounds and so since you can only carry one gram in your entire body at one time you have to constantly make this cycle going now there's a better way to show this, um, and let me, uh, let's get you a new page over here, okay? What happens is, let's use black over here. All right, so we have ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and we want to release the energy. So we're going to get rid of the energy. Okay, when we do that, we chop off the phosphate, and when we do that, we have two phosphates left. So that would be adenosine diphosphate. Well, since you took off one, that other phosphate it has to be over here. All right. If we reverse the reaction, we need to put the energy back in. And so we would attach this phosphate back to here. And we go back to ATP. So it's actually a little bit easier if you would draw it like this. ATP to ADP plus P, 
and back here. Nice drawing. All right. So what happens here is you've got energy out. And to go back this way, you have to do the reverse. You have to have energy end. All right. Now, this process is vital to every single living thing. That once this cycle stops, that organism is going to very quickly die. A lot of the poisons that will, will kill people, they interfere with this. And in fact, the last thing that's used to get you from ADP to ATP is oxygen. And so if you don't get you enough oxygen, you stop making ATP and you're dead. All right. Let's go back to where we were. All right. Now, in this example, this is very typical of a lot of textbooks. Here's ADP. And remember, the D means two phosphates, one, two. And there's that phosphate. So we have just a little bit of energy, but we want to add more. So if we add energy in, we get our back to ATP. So remember, here we've got two. And over here, we've got three. And so they're using this battery analogy. You've got a partially charged battery, because remember, there's still a little bit of bond or a little bit of energy right here in this bond. And over here, we have a full battery. And remember, this is reversible. It is going to go back. All right. So for this chapter eight and for our, our companion chapter, chapter nine, we're going to talk about this ATP cycle a lot and how vital it is because if this cycle ever stops, that's the end of that organism. All right. This will conclude podcast number one from chapter eight.